Great Hello, episode. everyone. Welcome to another CU Prime Talk. Uh, so today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Saram, who's going to tell us all about quantum drums. Uh, do you have another slide about CU oh, yeah. Prime? Great. So if you do not already know, uh, CU Prime is a student organization devoted to building community among the physics and adjacent departments at CU. And so we do so uh, through a set of diversity workshops, through a class that's run by students and for students, and through a mentorship program, which is currently on a break, but hopefully we'll be back soon. And primarily we do that through this talk series. So we uh, hope to present research in a jargon-free way uh, by graduate students and just to get an idea of what uh, it means to do research at the upper level and to just hear from different students at all different levels. So if you have any questions throughout the talk, feel free to interrupt. And this isn't your normal talk. So at different points, we will uh, take a break so that you can discuss with your neighbor of specific questions. So feel free to get to know the people around you at those times. And uh, yeah, without further ado, join me in welcoming Saran. Great, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks to you, Prime, for having me. Um, as Tyler said, this is supposed to be jargon-free. If I say something that you don't understand, please ask me, so I will just blaze by it and not recognize. Uh, but yeah, let's get started. Um, a little dark. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, this didn't work. Great. So uh, my title, title of my talk today is sort of quantum drums. Uh, I, uh, yeah, as Tyler said, uh, as Tyler said, my name is Sarang. I'm a sixth year graduate graduate student. Yep, uh, that's right. Um, and uh, today, I just want to tell you about some of the research that I do, how I got here, and sort of what it's like to uh, be a grad student uh, here at CU. Um, so yeah, here's the outline. Talk a little bit about me. Uh, we'll cover sort of three different topics in physics and how they relate to my research. Uh, and then we'll go into like a, what, you know, sort of what it looks like to be a grad student. Um, so starting with me, uh, I was born in India. Um, here's a little picture of me playing cricket. Uh, my parents and I moved to the US when I was about four or five years old. We moved to Atlanta, Georgia, where I have grown up. Uh, I went to elementary, middle school, high school there. Um, uh, I'd say probably the most, uh, the thing that I did most during that time that sort of influenced me to be engineering and uh, physics in general or science in general was uh, at high school. I was a big part of my high school's uh, robotics team, uh, uh, sort of this first robotics competition that uh, maybe some of you have heard of. Um, great. Uh, then in uh, 2018, I graduated high school, went to college. Uh, I went to the California Institute of Technology, uh, which is in Pasadena, California, a beautiful place to be, far from home, but um, so it was. Uh, I did sort of a lot of things when I got to Caltech. Uh, when I got to Caltech, I first thought I wanted to be an electrical engineer. I was like very sure that this is what I wanted to do. And I took my first electrical engineering class and I hated it. So it was the worst thing. Oh my God, I can't imagine, I can't believe I do all these things. Uh, circuits don't make that much sense to me, which is ironic because that's what I do now, but anyway. Um, uh, so uh, in my exploration, I sort of did a lot of different physics uh, at Caltech. My first summer, I spent uh, the project that I spent the most time on was um, uh, sort of helping to uh, unpack data from the Cassini satellite that went to Saturn. Uh, turns out actually at the south pole of Saturn, this is at the bottom of Saturn, uh, it has this really strange hexagonal structure to the clouds. Uh, they think this is due to the magnetic field, uh, or what's generating the or what's generating the magnetic field uh, that that that's that that's on Saturn. But I was basically sort of unpacking some some data and doing some very basic uh, an analysis on it. But that was a good way to step my feet into sort of the world of sort of physics research. Uh, the next uh, and this was done at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is sort of just down the street from Caltech. Um, after that, I got a little bit more applied. I spent some time building, uh, this is sort of a, uh, this is a sort of a measurement setup for a cryogenic system. Um, so this is like a special fridge that can cool stuff down really cold. I'll actually talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, I also worked on sort of characterizing electronics. Um, and 
And those, so those are my next two summers. And then for my senior sort of thesis work, uh, I went back to sort of theory stuff. Uh, I ended up working on using some sort of uh, some standard uh, things from, from statistical mechanics to try to understand how we might train uh, neural networks or sort of AI better. Um, and for the purpose of sort of high energy physics type stuff, uh, this is a picture of me presenting at a uh, at a poster session. Um, so yeah, sort of ran the gamut theory, uh, high energy physics, uh, astrophysics, planetary physics, very applied electron generating stuff. Uh, I think that was a great way to sort of get my feet into all the different types of things you can do uh, as a physicist. Um, uh, then I uh, so eventually graduated uh, and came to CU. Uh, I kind of had an interesting uh, process in applying to grad school. I applied to 14 grad schools because I wasn't sure I was going to get in. Uh, and I only got into one grad school, which was here. Um, but you only need to get into one. Um, so here I am. Um, and uh, doing like really work that I like. I like being a boulder. So sort of it worked out. Um, um, so my research is done in uh, my two advisors. My main advisor is Conrad Leonard. Uh, he's my sort of uh, research advisor, but uh, the project that I'm on that I'll talk about later is co-advised by him and Cindy Regal, uh, who and both of them are over in Jilla, which is sort of just just down the way over there, if you don't know. Um, obviously, I spent a lot of my time doing research, but uh, that's not all the time I spent doing. Um, during the pandemic, I hiked, I, I hiked the JMT, uh, which is a 200 mile through hike. Uh, this is a picture at the end on Mount Whitney. Uh, I also played on and I coach and I coach, I now coach the men's ultimate frisbee team uh, here at CU. Um, I, I like to go skiing uh, and uh, here's me and my friends playing D&D, &D, which is what we do every, uh, every, every Saturday. So um, grad school can be a fun time too. So let it, <laughs> um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, and maybe now we'll sort of get into some physics. Um, so I'm going to start with a question. Uh, and that question is, how can we change the color of light? So let's say I give you a blue laser, but for whatever application you need, you need to be an orange laser or a red laser or a green laser. How might you do that? Uh, how do you get the light from one frequency from, from one color to another? Uh, think about maybe, do you need any special materials? What limits the frequencies that you can go from? You know, are there some frequencies that you can't go to? Maybe a little hint here, you might need something and I'm saying here's a sort of a special material. Um, so take some time. I'll give you about three or four minutes and uh, discuss with your neighbors. Okay, sounds like uh, people have uh, have some ideas. Um, you want to raise your hands or just shout them out or let's raise our hands. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so you have a material where you find light at a one frequency and it absorbs that at a one frequency that has a bunch of different media processes that then well, it's a maybe on the at like a lower frequency or something like that. That could be that. Yeah, that's definitely one way. Uh, any other ideas? Yeah. I didn't know if you could uh, have some sort of material with the and then it's Yep, yep. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, anybody else? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I apologize. This is a kind of a trick question, not really. Um, so it turns out putting light through a medium does not change its color. Um, and that's because uh, when I put light through a medium, uh, you actually change the, both the speed of light and the wavelength at the same time. And it turns out what color light is depends on its frequency. Uh, and so uh, because both of these things change at the same time, you can see that the frequency is unchanged in this expression. Uh, and maybe if you don't believe me, you can go home and put a green laser through some water and you'll see it won't change color. Um, so the frequency is unchanged. So I apologize for the trick question, but uh, um, uh, there are other... But yeah, that was up. How do we know it doesn't change color though? Because it goes in the water, but the only thing we see is thing coming out back into the air, right? That's true. Uh... Sorry, I'm being conscious. No, 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 no. I'm trying to think of a good answer here. Um... 
equation. <laughs> yeah, the equation will tell you that. Yeah, so what you're actually doing is you're changing like, um, take my word for it for now. Uh, <laughs> I can't think of a nice way to explain it. That's you're saying if you put the camera underwater. I think you would also see green. Okay. Um, but, sorry, how is that perception? Uh, so like, you have a mode processor, you may be explaining like, molecules in your eyes, so you can go into a media once they hit your eyes. That's a great answer. Thanks, Luca. Uh, Luca's my lab mate, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, yeah, exactly. So maybe when you see color, it's already going through medium. Um, uh, okay. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't know who was it in in the front here, uh, but I wanted what, but what I wanted to get at is yes, maybe uh, the way that you can do this is what uh, one possibility is using a nonlinear material. So there are sort of these special materials. Uh, that have uh, some internal uh, thing in them that they like to absorb light at one frequency and emit it at another. Um, uh, and so uh, you can sort of see that here in this picture that I pulled from YouTube where this guy is shining his blue laser at this, what looks like this uh, sort of just vial of liquid and out comes an orange laser. So, so something inside of here is sort of absorbing uh, light at one frequency and emitting it at the other. And we oftentimes will call this sort of uh, a nonlinear material uh, because it doesn't have sort of the linear uh, uh, the linear effects that you would expect from sort of the index of refraction. Um, but uh, so good, this will, lets you change the color of light, but you're kind of limited by the material, right? If the material doesn't have a transition right where you want it, you can't get to that frequency. And these materials are kind of exotic, right? Uh, for example, examples are lithium nivate. Uh, this one I had to look up the name, it's potassium titanyl phosphate. Uh, and then we have uh, a cesium lithoborate. Anyway, um, so I mean, they may look like sort of regular crystals, but if I look at this sort of the atomic structure, it's really complicated. And if I want to sort of change the levels that are available, the different frequencies that I can access, I might need to like engineer this atomic structure and that sounds hard. Uh, uh, and so I don't wanna do that. Um, so maybe uh, what I'm gonna talk about in this talk is another way that we can get to this that um, that is sort of easier and a little bit more flexible sort of all different types of frequencies. Um, before we talk about that, we're gonna go back to sort of first year physics and talk about harmonic oscillators. Um, so harmonic oscillators, uh, which uh, you can sort of just think of anything that oscillates with a constant frequency, um, they come in sort of all shapes, right? We have our little Deion Sanders bub bobblehead, which you can think of as just like a mass on a spring. Uh, we have uh, these balls in this ramp, a pendulum, a drum head, right? When you hit the drum head, the top of the drum is vibrating. Um, same thing with this wave tank here, uh, violin string, even in, in this sort of, uh, I guess, picture of it, you can even see the wavelength of the string. Um, maybe these ones are more familiar, but we can also make harmonic oscillators uh, out of an LC circuit. So this is sort of an inductor a capacitor, very standard uh, very standard uh, things in a, uh, in a sort of electrical engineer's toolbox. And maybe this one down here is a little bit more, um, more obscure, but this is sort of a, a, an optical cavity. So what's done here is these two, this and this here are two mirrors. And uh, in uh, and in between the two mirrors that can support um, like a standing wave of light. Uh, another way to think about this optical cavity is it's is it's a wave tank for light. Um, and I think if you use that analogy throughout the talk, you'll 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 understand it quite well. Um, so yeah, they come in all different shapes, um, and we can sort of sort them into their frequencies too. So these ones that are sort of you can see oscillate uh, with your eye. Or you're in the you know 0.1 to 10 hertz scale. Uh, these ones are sort of the audio frequency bands, things that you can hear, are often on the 10 hertz to sort of 10 kilohertz scale. Um, these LC circuits oftentimes oscillate in these uh, in sort of what we call the microwave regime. But microwave is one of sort of the bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, and this is in the 100 megahertz to 10 gigahertz. 
Uh, one megahertz is 10 to the six, so a million times, and the gigahertz is 10 to the nine, so a billion times. So this thing is oscillating uh, anywhere between you know, 100 million times to 10, uh, 10 billion times a second. And these laser cavities, uh, they can oscillate even faster, so hundreds of trillions of times a second. Um, uh, Great. So harmonic oscillators, cool. You can make them in all, all different sorts of ways. Um, but what happens when I connect two of them? So I have a video here. Uh, and in this video, there is one uh, mass on a, on a little pendulum here uh, and another mass on a, on a pendulum here. And they're connected by a spring. And what this guy's going to do when I play the video is he's going to hold one of the masses fixed, move one of the other masses, and release it. And uh, maybe uh, with your neighbor, discuss what you think will happen, and then we'll play the video uh, and and see what actually happens. So I'll give you a few minutes again. Yeah. Yeah. So this one is going to be held stationary initially. This one's going to be But he will let go of both of them, and they'll be free to move after. Okay. Um, let's 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 bring it back. Uh, do you want to offer a prediction or should we just watch the video? Okay, let's just watch the video. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're in the same plane. So I'm just going to take this one, move it over here, and then let both of them go. Okay, let's watch the video. Hopefully this works. We'll watch it through once and then I'll talk about it in a second. So what you can see happening is at, uh, uh, all the energy ends up in one oscillator and then finds its way all the way back to the other and sort of comes back and forth such that it's all the energy uh, at sort of at one point in this in, in in this cycle, all the energy is in one oscillator. At another point, all the energy is in the other oscillator. Um, uh, and uh, maybe to sort of prime you for later, you can also think about this as if, if I put if there's some information stored, say, and how you know, maybe maybe I told you if the if this moves by two centimeters, that means one. And if it moves by three centimeters, that means zero. That means I, I also transfer information from one oscillator to the other oscillator. Uh, so the main thing I want to take away from here is that when I couple these oscillators together, they sort of exchange energy, energy in a way that you can have it all in one and then all in the other, then it'll come back. Um, uh, but what do I mean by coupling? That's the question I want to answer next. So if I just have, so here's a simplified version of that picture uh, where I have two masses on a spring. Uh, and they know nothing about each other. There's, let's say they're in vacuum. There's no air here. They have no idea the other one exists. Uh, we can we know that the force uh, from the spring is given by this uh, quantity known as the spring constant. This is just how stiff the spring is, uh, uh, and the amount of this spring is uh, is is either pushed or, or pulled. That's this x here, and we know that it's opposite the direction that you push or pull because of this minus sign. Uh, and so as a result, we'll get uh, we'll, we'll get that this system will oscillate at a frequency given by this expression. Um, uh, but you know these sort of, these things know nothing about each other in this setup. However, if we add a mass, what we'll notice here is that when this left mass moves to the right, it's going to. Uh, so I'll add a spring in the middle here. When this left mass moves to the right, it will change the length of this spring in the middle which will apply a force to this, to this right mass. And when this mass is in a different position, it applies a different force. So what I mean by coupling is essentially that the state of one oscillator, so the state of this spring mass system, changes the restoring force in the other oscillator, or in other words, changes the frequency of the other oscillator. So somehow the state of one changes the state of the other. And that's sort of the exact same thing that's happening back in this picture, where uh, when the state of, you can think of the state of this pendulum as where it is uh, in the oscillation, that changes the length of the spring, which changes 
how you know the sort of the forces that this mass experiences. Um, so that's what I mean by coupling. Uh, uh, and basically the force of the fact that the, the force on the system depends on the state of the other oscillator. Great, so that's that's a nice review, uh, hopefully, of coupled harmonic oscillators. Um, now, I wanna ask the question, so I showed a few slides ago that we have this sort of these, all of these exotic harmonic oscillators, right? We have these ones that oscillate at uh, mil uh, billions of times a second. We have these ones that oscillate at trillions of times a second. And these ones that are, or sorry, this is a bit, um, billions, trillions. And these ones that oscillate slower. Um, and the question is, and sort of the tool that we use in, in the research that I do, is how can I get these two things to talk to each other? How can I get the state of the drum to change the state of my LC circuit? Or how can I get the, the state of my Deion Sanders bobblehead to change the state of my optical cavity? And what I want to point out here is that in both of these systems, the frequency of the oscillator depends on the position of something, right? So the frequency of this oscillator depends on the position of the mirrors, how far they are apart. Uh, and so if I just change the distance of the mirrors, I can change the frequency. Similarly, in this case, uh, the frequency here depends on the capacitance. And we know that the capacitance depends on the distance. If we just have a parallel plate capacitor, depends on the distance between those two plates. So if I just change that distance, I can change the capacitance and change the frequency. And what's really cool is that motion, uh, these two things, changes the distance, changes the distance of, of something, right? So if I can find a way to uh, incorporate these two things together, I can do what we call electromechanics or optomechanics, where I'm coupling an electrical system to a mechanical oscillator or an optical system to a mechanical oscillator. And this is what that sort of looks like schematically, where I basically put one mirror on a spring and that changes the length, or I put one, uh, one of my capacitor pads on a spring and that changes the capacitance. Or if you want to look at those other pictures again, basically putting a drum in here or you know, patterning the side of Deion Sanders' head as a mirror. Uh, maybe a sunglasses will work. Um, so, uh, and this, even though these systems are wildly different from the spring, and the oscillator that I showed earlier, it's the same physics. So if I put an excitation in this drum head, it will eventually end up in this electrical circuit. Same thing here, if I put an excitation, if I start moving Dion's head, that, that energy or that information will end up in this optical cavity, even though those things are like, even though this thing oscillates at one hertz and this thing oscillates at uh, 100 terahertz. Um, it's, Literally the same physics, which is, I think is really cool. Uh, we just took these like two wildly different things and we said, mash them together and see what happens. And so, uh, so now I've shown you how to go from uh, one frequency of light to motion. Um, but let's take it one step further uh, and let's take three oscillators. So now I have uh, the same system, a very similar system before where I have one oscillator on the spring another mass in a spring, another mass in a spring, and they're all coupled uh, via, uh, sort, of, sort of this K3, sorry, oscillator three is coupled to oscillator one, and oscillator two is coupled to oscillator one. But oscillator two and three, uh, in principle, don't know anything about each other except for the fact that this oscillator is here. In a similar way that you can get motion or energy to move from one oscillator to another, in this three oscillator system, actually the same thing will happen. If I put energy in this oscillator, it'll find its way to this one and then eventually find its way to this one. So maybe you guess what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna make one of these my microwave circuit. I'm gonna make one of these my drum. And I'm gonna make the last one of these my optical cavity. And what happens is let's say I put some energy in this electrical circuit, it'll find its way into this drum head. And then eventually, that'll find its way into the optical cavity. And I've taken something that's at, uh, you know, oscillating at a billion times a second and made it oscillate the same thing at a hundred trillion times a second. Um, and this is all just the physics of coupled harmonic oscillators. Uh, so you like, you could go home and make this system and you would see this physics happening. Uh, and we're doing the same thing with, uh, with sort of just more exotic versions of, of a harmonic oscillator. Great. So, um, that seems a little too simple for a PhD. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so let's add the word quantum in front of it. <laughs> and uh, what does quantum mean? Um, and why, why is it useful? Um, so the analogy I like to think about for quantum information is it's like a snowflake. It's really intricate. There's lots of information stored in there, but it's really fragile, right? As soon as I like touch it, it melts. If the temperature gets too hot, it melts. Um, just like it, it doesn't want to stick around for long if there's too much other stuff messing with it. Um, uh, and some, uh, so that's the picture I'd like you to have in your head about what quantum information is like. Uh, and a quick review of, uh, or a quick overview of quantum mechanics. I don't expect you guys to remember this, but try to keep it in your head. One is that we actually know that energy comes in packets. So there's uh, individual units of energy. We call this the fact that it's quantized. And uh, that means it's the smallest bundle of energy. So uh, it's, you know, there's one packet, two packet, three packet. So when I said, you know, put energy into the system, I mean, I maybe I'm saying put two packets of energy or one packet of energy, but I can't put half a packet of energy. Great. Uh, next uh, is when is that when I go to measure a system, it has an effect, meaning that when I measure something, it changes the state of what it was. Uh, there's no way to just look at something. And that's a sort of like asking a crush if I like you, or if you look at our snowflake analogy, let's say I want to know how cold the snowflake is. So I touch it with my hand. Now I know how cold it is, but I melted the snowflake. Oh, uh, so you learn something, but you also destroy the system. Um, and lastly, uh, there's this thing known as superposition. So this one is uh, not that important for, for, for this talk. I felt like I would include it anyway. Uh, this is this the idea, the, the idea that uh, you can have uh, you, uh, um, an object can be in sort of two states at the same time. Um, which is sort of sort of something fundamentally weird, and like you shouldn't think it's normal, and like it should bother you. Um, but basically, this is uh, the idea of like sh uh, Schrodinger's cat. Um, but again, this won't be that important for this talk. Great. Um, so as I as as I said here, we know that sort of quantum information is very fragile. Uh, it, it's 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 prone to go away if 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 we're not careful. And one of the things that can sort of make it go away are thermal vibrations. Um, so similar to the snowflake, if you heat it up, it melts. And the way to know maybe how sensitive uh, my quantum information will be, or my quantum oscillator will be to thermal vibrations is if I compare the thermal energy, which is just the Boltzmann's constant times the temperature, to the energy of the oscillator, which is uh, Planck's constant times the frequency. And all I'm going to do here is I'm simply just going to take the ratio of these two things this will tell me approximately how sensitive uh, my system is or how much the, the thermal environment is messing with my object, messing with my snowflake. Um, ideally, we want sort of less than one so that it's happening uh, not that often. And uh, just remind you that Kelvin is an absolute unit of temperature. So at room temperature or 300 Kelvin, um, you'll notice that this depends on the frequency of the oscillator. So if you plug in these numbers, it turns out that lasers and optical cavities, cold. They have no idea that the environment is, is hot, uh, is, is moving around all the time. Uh, they don't care. Uh, microwave circuits and, L and LC circuits, they see about a thousand, uh, uh, like a thousand uh, uh, units of sort of excitations pushing them around. Uh, and these drums, which are the, the drums that we work with are around a megahertz, they're even worse. They see a, a million of these things pushing them around. And so uh, in this way, even if we had put some sort of quantum information in our system where we could move it from one oscillator to another, we would sort of destroy it pretty quickly. We can get around this. Uh, in our lab, we have these special refrigerators that uh, cool stuff down to 10 millikelvin, which is uh, much like a thousand times colder than, or a hundred times colder than outer space. Uh, and if you plug in these numbers at this temperature, again, our lasers is fine. Now our microwave circuit, also fine. It sees very little, uh, it sees very little uh, stuff. Uh, but our drums are still not happy. They see still about 100 of these things pushing them around all the time. Um, and so that's that. Um, but it turns out there's uh, other ways to cool a mechanical oscillator. And so uh, last question of the day. Um, Oops, ah, no one saw that. Um, I want to, so the think about a child on a swing and they're moving back and forth. How might you imagine uh, increasing the motion or decreasing the motion 
Uh, and I want to think about like, how often might you push? Uh, or like, uh, when would you push uh, to either increase or decrease the motion and be like, when is the most efficient time to push? And those sorts of questions. Um, great, so yeah, take a few minutes to discuss with your neighbor. We have gravity and friction. Uh, gravity, no friction. You can add friction if you want. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, does anyone want to venture, I guess? Okay, no worries, I'll talk about it. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, yeah, so exactly. Uh, if you want to cool the motion, you need to push opposite the direction that the child is moving. And if you want to increase the motion, you need to push in the direction that the child is moving. Um, I kind of posed the, the how often question not very well. Uh, what I wanted to get at is, let's say I'm pushing much faster. So let's say it takes one second for the child to go from here to here and then come back. And I push a hundred times during that, during that cycle, right? Half the time I'm pushing when the child is moving away from me and half the time I'm pushing when the child is moving towards me. So on average, I'll do nothing, right? If I push really slow, so let's say I push once every hundred seconds instead of a hundred times a second, I just won't, it'll take me a long time to slow them down, right? So what you wanna do is approximately push once every oscillation. So you wanna push about once every time. Uh, and so we can do sort of exactly that. Um, the specifics of that are a little complicated, but essentially we can be the child or we can be the parent for this drum and just push it every time it's moving uh, and cool it down to below having, to basically having on average less than one occupation uh, or one unit of energy inside of it. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you relate that to a temperature, that ends up being something like 50 micro Kelvin, um, which is another, a uh, thousand times colder than the fridge can get. Um, great, so what does this look like in real life? Uh, this is what our devices look like. Um, what we do is uh, we put a, we have, here's our microwave circuit with our inductor and a capacitor. And this was sort of showing the drum head here. Uh, and we put one, we, we put one metal plate of the capacitor on the drum head. Uh, such that we get that drum LC circuit coupling that I talked about earlier. At the same time, we have two mirrors and we just put the drum inside the mirror. And this uh, acts like, this is very similar to putting one of the mirrors uh, on, or, or putting uh, like putting one of the mirrors on this drum head. It, the motion of this drum will change the frequency of the optical cavity. And so we do this at the same time uh, and we get this sort of system of three coupled oscillators that I was showing a few slides ago. Uh, where we have our LC circuit coupled to our mechanical resonator, which is then coupled to this optical cavity. And this sort of this is what these devices look like. Um, you, they, you can you can sort of hold them in your hand; they're not very big, um, but we can sort of all all do all these things. And this little green patch here, that is our little mechanical drum. Um, okay, cool. So great, you can we can do this. Why is it? Why should I care? Um, and the reason you should care is because of quantum computers. Uh, I think many of us have heard of quantum computers. I'm not gonna go into exactly why you might wanna make a quantum computer, but let's say I have a quantum computer. Um, one of the, you know, uh, Google's, for, for example, Google's quantum computer, it works at sort of these gigahertz frequencies. Uh, and because of that, uh, as I said, quantum information is very sensitive to thermal oscillations. And so they have to put it in, uh, the, they've put it in one of these special fridges. This is one of the fridges in our lab. This is not Google's fridge. Um, and uh, turns out it's very hard to make these things very big, right? The scale of this thing is about, this is about the size of me. That's about the size of it. And this thing costs half a million dollars or yeah, half a million dollars. And so if you wanted to build something like this that stretched from, let's say here to, I don't know, San Francisco, that would be ridiculously expensive. You would never be able to do it. Um, so then how do we get quantum information from one place to another if I can't build a fridge that big? Well, uh, 
we'll use light. We'll do, uh, we saw earlier that light is cold at room temperature. So what we'll do is we'll take our quantum information, we'll use our, our, our system of three coupled harmonic oscillators to take that from five gigahertz to optical light. We'll put it on optical fiber. We can run that optical fiber as long as we want. Now on the other end, we'll just put another one of these things. And then that will go from the optical cavity the mechanical oscillator into our superconducting, uh, or sorry, into our in, into our microwave circuit, and so this way we can sort of hope to build long distance like quantum compute uh, quantum networks or the quantum internet. Uh, and so this is why you would, might want to make this thing. Great. Um, so that's the end of the physics. Uh, I'll I now I'll give a short in, uh, recap of sort of what it's like to be a grad student. Um, as an experimentalist on a day-to-day, -day, you kind of just do what needs to be done. Uh, and so that could be anything from taking data uh, to uh, machining parts, to aligning lasers, putting stuff in the fridge, uh, dealing with plumbing, uh, doing math, like just doing physics theory, uh, uh, and even sort of making making the devices that we use, uh, making the devices that I've shown. So every day is really like you come in, What's broken today? Let's fix that. Uh, what do we need to work on today? Let's do that. And so, uh, what I what I actually do on a day to day basis changes very rapidly based on sort of the realities of the experiment. Um, but it involves a lot of different things. Um, uh, at sort of a bigger view, what does the what does the research cycle look like? Um, so we sort of start off with our design. We come up with here's what we think we should make. Uh, uh, this period involves sort of reading papers from other groups, running simulations on, you know, how is our mechanical oscillator going to work? Uh, how do we design this microwave circuit? Um, then we need to actually like put these into a, a design file, like a CAD file, uh, so that we can uh, make these things. This whole process takes about sort of one to two months. Uh, after we uh, design what we want to make, we try to make it. Um, I say try here because it, it doesn't always work. Uh, uh, so all the fab or all the fabrication that we do in my experiment is done over at the NIST clean room, uh, which is down the street. It's this really nice facility. We wear these bunny suits, um, uh, and it's sort of very, very clean, very little dust in the air. Uh, there's like, uh, yeah. Uh, and you know, sometimes things go well and you get nice, pretty stuff like this that works great. Sometimes other things happen. You don't know what happened. And sometimes you get to look at cool pictures. I have no idea what happened here but it looks cool, so. Um, this is also sort of a one to two month process. And then sort of the longest uh, period of this is sort of the measure analyze period. Uh, we make lots of devices at once. We need to measure all of them. Uh, it takes some time for our fridge to cool down, to do all the data analysis, to write all the code, to think about are we even measuring the right thing? And uh, so this is about the year time scale. Um, Oftentimes we'll run into a problem. We're like, oh, okay, we actually need to change the design. So we'll go back to this step and go through that process again. Um, in experimental physics, I'd say every like two to three years is, is reasonable. Uh, uh, publishing every year is very hard because it takes a long time to do things. Um, uh, but you know, sort of every year we present at conferences. So this is me in Chicago two years ago, uh, and. Also, sort of, uh, I don't want to leave out that this is all done as part of a group. Uh, I'm not the only person doing all this work. Uh, most of my work is actually mostly on the microwave side or on the LC circuit side. Uh, uh, and I have lots of great, great lab mates who help me with everything else. Um, but yeah, that's the conclusion. Uh, hopefully you learned today how we can use harmonic oscillators to, to, to make different frequencies of light talk to each other. And, um, you know, I think grad school is... It's hard, but you know I've, I've learned a lot, and it's, it can be very rewarding. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Uh, if you guys want to ask me questions, feel free. Yeah, what questions do we have? Yeah. So this might introduce a little bit of jargon, but I'm curious, it's like what the drums are that you're studying? Are they like, are you basically looking at phenomenal crystals from like lattice vibrations, or is it like an actual like membrane? Yeah, so that's yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so what it is, uh, you can, I think in this picture, you can probably see it the best. Uh, so in this middle thing here, we have, uh, exactly what you said. It's basically a really stressed piece of dielectric, uh, silicon nitride. Um, 
uh, and that it's stressed because of how we make it. Uh, made up that answer, but uh, this phenotic crystal, there is a phenotic crystal structure here, which is more to isolate it from its environment and less like less to uh, determine its motion. Um, it you know if you just sit down and write down the modes of a rectangular sheet of, st of stretch material, you'll get the modes of this uh, oscillator. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's like it's, it's it's definitely a drum. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, it, that's almost exactly what it is. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, you. It, it's. We try to make it a square. Sometimes it's a rectangle. Um, yeah. Can you say that one more time? Besides magnitude, there any other outside effects that can increase or decrease the vaping permission of the solutions? Uh good. Um so uh, what I talked about uh what I talked about here was sort of a perfect process, right? Like I only push when I mean to push. I never push on accident, that kind of stuff. Um, so what can also happen, uh, the way we sort of do this push in our, in, our, in our experiment is we have just a microwave generator that applies power at, as, as, at a certain frequency. Uh, but you can imagine if you apply power at other frequencies that might like do the wrong thing or push at the wrong time. Uh, and so, uh, in principle, no, but in reality, the experiment's not perfect. Uh, and you get these sort of other things that happen that uh, make it hard to um, do, do just the thing you want to do. You do other things as well. That's a good question. Cool. If I could ask one more yeah. question. So I see it's not just a drug that you fabricate, it's also the surrounding. Yeah. What's, what's all that about? Yeah. So the uh, most of the motion is confined to the drum. Um, uh, I think if you take even a real drum and you hit it, most of the motion is in the part that you hit, but also some of it will like radiate into the in, into what's holding it. Uh, and so uh, I imagine if you hit a drum and then held the side, uh, you could probably feel that vibration. Uh, and that's bad for us. We want all of the information that's in the... Uh, that's in the membrane to stay in the membrane so they can get from one place to the other, right? The membrane is kind of just like a road in between these two places. And if you're driving down the road, you end up somewhere else. You should imagine that's like losing information. And so what we're doing here is we're just uh, changing, uh, basically making it so that the membrane doesn't, uh, it, it, it basically like a mechanical filter. Uh, so it can't, uh, at the frequency that this thing oscillates, it doesn't know that there's a chip out here. Other questions? Hopefully you have more, feel free to come up if you're willing to yeah. stay uh, and ask questions. But if not, then let's thank the speaker one more time.